and welcome back to the series on single variable calculus. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of integration of functions and start to develop a little bit more of a theoretical basis um, for those operations. So what exactly is a definite integral? So as we were talking last time, the definite integral can be viewed as the area underneath some curve, hopefully continuous but not necessarily needed, on some finite, closed, or potentially unbounded and open interval um, from some number a to b, right? So let's assume that we're on a finite interval a, b, and let's assume that f is continuous just for simplicity now. Then this area underneath this curve is referred to as the definite integral of f of x from x is equal to a to x is equal to b. So if you do not know any theoretical foundations for uh, integrals, then we know we can approximate this area via a variety of different schemes, in particular uh, left endpoint rectangle approximations. In particular, that's given by a and l is equal to the sum from k is equal to 0 to m minus 1 of f of the left endpoint plus k delta x times the spacing between each of those consecutive subintervals, which is usually given by b minus a over m, where delta x equals b minus a over m, right? So this expression has another name. It's called a Riemann sum, right? So that's just a Riemann sum, which is allowing us to approximate the exact area underneath that curve. So if you remember, something about uh, this area approximation or this Riemann sum, then you should know that the limit as n goes to infinity of delta x or equivalently delta x goes to zero of the error term of the left-hand rectangle approximation, this is equal to zero. So if the error goes to zero between the approximation and the exact area, then we can conclude that the limit as n goes to infinity, or equivalently as delta x goes to zero, of our area approximation, this is precisely equal to the exact area, the integral from a to b of f of x, dx. Right? So therefore, you can say that the integral is just a limit of a Riemann sum. Right? So let's look at a particular example of a limit of a Riemann sum and see if we can get some formulas out of this. Let's do the integral from a to b of some constant c with respect to x. So here c is going to be any real number. So the integral of a constant function. So what does a constant function look like? Well, we should know that that is just going to be a horizontal line in the x, y plane. Right. So what we're doing is we're looking at some left end point A, some left end point B, and we're looking for the area underneath this curve on that interval. So our question is, what is this area equal to? I mean, geometrically, that's just a rectangle, so you should be able to find that area. But let's see if the limit of a Riemann sum actually agrees with that geometric interpretation. So what we have here is what? So this is going to be equal to the limits as n goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to 0 to m minus 1. So we know that regardless of the value of x, because keep in mind we're going to evaluate a plus k delta x, regardless of the value of x, f of x is always equal to that constant c. So what we have here is c times that spacing delta x, and that's precisely what we have. So it's actually not too complicated, which is pretty nice. So c doesn't depend on the number of subintervals, and delta x, which keep in mind is just b minus a over m, doesn't entirely depend on the length of the subintervals, but there is an n there, so we can only factor out the b minus a. So we're going to have c times b minus a multiplied by the limits as n goes to infinity of 1 over m times that remaining sum, which is the sum from 0 to m minus 1 of 1, because we factor out that c. So if we do 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 from 0 to m minus 1, keep in mind the distance from 0 to m minus 1, that's just n iterations of a sum, right? So it's 1 plus 1 plus 1, n times, so 1 plus 1 is n. So 
that's just going to give us c times b minus a times the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times m, right? And we know that 1 over n times n is just equal to 1, so this is just going to be equal to c times b minus a times the limit as n goes to infinity of 1, but regardless of the value of n, 1 is always equal to 1, so that's just equal to 1, so we're just going to be left with c times b minus a, right? So that's the definite integral of a constant on some interval a, b. And, well, is that true? Well, the distance from a to b, that's just going to be equal to b minus a, and the height of this function is just going to be equal to c, um, therefore the area of that rectangle is just height times width, so it's just c times b minus a, um, which definitely matches our geometric interpretation, which is actually pretty nice. Let's look at another example, in particular the integral from a to b of the identity linear function x. So what exactly does this function look like? So if we remind ourselves what y equals x looks like, that's just a line with a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. So if we choose an arbitrary interval, say a, b, it's likely that this is going to be the area of a trapezoid, right? And you may or may not remember the formula for that. But even if you don't, what would that area formula be for general intervals a, b? So let's look at our limit of Riemann sums. So this is just going to be equal to the limits as the number of subpartitions goes to infinity of the sum. Now, keep in mind, as long as this function is continuous, which linear functions definitely are, we can actually approximate the area under the curve via left endpoint rectangles, right endpoint rectangles, midpoint, trapezoid, Simpsons, or other. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and use some uh, right endpoint rectangles because the math is just a little bit more easier here. In particular, it's easier to count um, because k starts at 1 and ends at n, which is sometimes a little bit more easier to deal with. And then we're going to have the function evaluated at a plus k delta x, which is just going to be a plus k delta x since we just have a uh, identity function because f of x is equal to x. And then we're going to be multiplying by delta x, and then we're going to do some algebra and hope for the best. So what do we have? So this is just going to be equal to the limits as n goes to infinity. And what I want to do is I want to distribute the sum to each of these terms. And let's also distribute our delta x to each of these terms as well. So once I do that, I'm going to have the sum from k is equal to 1 to n of a delta x in the first term, and then plus the sum from k is equal to 1 to n of k times delta x squared for the second term. Now, uh, delta x does not depend on k, so I can factor them out. And a doesn't depend on k either, so I can factor it out as well. So that's just going to give us the limit as n goes to infinity of a delta x times the sum from k is equal to 1 to n of 1 plus delta x, the quantity squared, times the sum from k is equal to 1 to n of k. Right? So this sum is pretty easy. That's just 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 in time, so that's just going to be equal to m. And this is just going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up to n. So that's just an arithmetic sequence, which we should know to be n times m plus 1 divided by 2. And if you don't remember that, you can take that as axiomatic for now. So once we substitute those uh, finite series into this expression, we're going to have the limit as n goes to infinity of a times delta x, which is going to be equal to b minus a divided by m. And then let's multiply by m. And then over here, we're going to have b minus a squared over n squared times that arithmetic sum m times m plus 1 divided by 2. All right? So now we can do some cancellations here because we have an n and an n, which is going to cancel. We have an n and an n squared, which is going to cancel as well, which is actually pretty nice. And notice that we have a b minus a and two b minus a's here, so we can factor out one outside of the entire limit. So once we do that, we're going to have b minus a multiplied by the limit as n goes to infinity. And what are we left with in that first term? So we're just going to be left with a, which is pretty simple. And here we're going to have what? So we're still going to have a b minus a, we still have that 2 on the bottom, and let's write this m plus 1 over n term 
together. All right, uh, let's get a common denominator for this other term. So let's multiply this by two uh, so we can factor out that two out of the entire thing. So we're gonna have b minus a all over two times the limit as n goes to infinity. And then here we're going to have 2a plus b minus a times n over n plus 1 over m. And now I'm going to take the limit. So as n goes to infinity, this is going to go to 0, and this is going to go to 1. So this is just going to leave us with b minus a over 2 multiplied by 2a plus b minus a. So 2a minus a, that's just going to be equal to 1a. So this is just going to be equal to 1 half b minus a times b plus a. And once we distribute that out, that should be a very familiar expression. This is just going to be 1 half b squared minus a squared. That's just the difference of squares. So this is just going to be the integral from a to b of our linear function x dx. Now, one notation for this um, is to realize that this is just the function, which I'm going to notate by capital F of x, x squared, evaluated at b, evaluated at a, and subtracted. And in calculus, we have a special notation for this type of operation. So we're going to write this as the integral from a to b of x dx is just precisely equal to one half the function x squared evaluated as x goes to b, as x goes to a, and this is implying that you're going to subtract those two functions in that order once you have it. And we've already proven that that value actually comes out to b squared minus a squared divided by 2. And that's the integral from uh, a to b for our identity function x. So up to this point, we've proven two definite integral identities um, for two very important classes of functions. In particular, the integral under a constant, in particular 1, um, is equal to x, evaluated from b minus a and then subtracted, giving us b minus a. And the integral of our identity x function from a to b is just 1 half x squared, evaluated from b to a, which just comes out to 1 half b squared minus a squared, in the very end. Now, one very interesting thing to notice here, and this may or may not be by coincidence, is that the derivative of that function x is just equal to the function we were integrating over. And if we take the derivative of 1 half x squared, we just get x which again is just, you know, the thing that we're trying to integrate over, right? Now, is that by chance? Maybe or maybe not. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But for now, what we're looking at is we're trying to generalize this property. Um, for example, this one is just x to the power of zero. This is just x to the power of one. What about x to the power of two? Well, using some similar tricks to the proof of x, one can show that the integral of x uh, to the power of two with respect to x is just going to be equal to one third x cubed evaluated as x goes to b and as x goes to a which is just going to come out to one third times b cubed minus a cubed and if you want to work out that proof you're going to have to realize that this is just going to be equal to b minus a times b squared plus a b plus b squared in the end right but what's most important at least for our examples is that particular expression there so again we have that the derivative of one third x cubed will just be equal to x squared. So again, is that by coincidence? Who knows? Um, but using mathematical induction or this little observation that I keep on mentioning, you should be able to extend this to any arbitrary power of n, at least in the natural numbers, right? So what I want to do is I want to state the formal statement of this, which is called the power rule. And it says this, that if you have the integral from a to b of x to the power of m minus 1 dx, where n is at least a natural number, um, this is going to be equal to 1 divided by n uh, times b to the n minus a to the n, right? And obviously we do have a restriction on our n here. Uh, n cannot be equal to 0, right? So that's what we refer to as the power rule for definite integrals. So now that we have this, let's do a couple examples to sort of see how this little power rule works. So let's start off with a couple easy ones. Let's do the integral from 1 to 3 of x dx. So we've already used this, but what we have there is 1 divided by 2 
times x squared, evaluated as x goes to 3 and as x goes to 2. So that's going to be equal to 1 half of 9 minus 4, which is just going to be equal to 5 halves or 2.5. Right? So that's pretty easy, right? So 3 halves squared is 9, 9 minus 4, 5, divided by 2, 5 halves. And of course, what I did was switch my limits. That should be the integral from 3 to 2. So let's look at another example. Let's do the integral from 2 to 3 of x squared dx. So that's just going to be equal to 1 third of 3 cubed minus 2 cubed. So it's going to be 1 third of 27 minus 8. So that's going to be equal to 19 thirds. So that's pretty nice. And let's jump up a little bit more. Let's do the integral from 0 to 7 of x cubed. So that's going to be 1 fourth, and then we're going to raise these things to the power of 4. So 7 to the 4th minus 0 to the 4th. 0 to the 4th is just going to be equal to 0. And 7 to the 4th is going to be 24 or 1 over 4. So if we have the integral, let's be a little bit more general here. The integral from a to a, where a is any real number, of x to the n dx, what's that going to be? So using that power rule again, we're going to have 1 over n plus 1 times x n plus 1 evaluated as x goes to a minus x goes to a. So you probably already know what this is going to come out to. But this is going to be equal to a to the n plus 1 minus a to the n plus 1. But they're precisely equal to the same number, so that's going to come out to 0. Right, and one can show that regardless of what that function is, if you integrate from a to a, um, then you're always going to get zero, which is interesting. Now, again, I just want to make one little note about the power rule. The integral from a to b of x to the n dx, which as we've already shown is just going to be equal to 1 over m plus 1 times x to the m plus 1 evaluated as x goes to b and as x goes to a, is only valid as long as n is not equal to minus 1. When n is equal to minus 1, we get what? That's going to give us the integral from a to b of x to the minus 1, which is the same as 1 over x. And you can ask yourself, well, what is that going to be equal to? If we use that little derivative observation here, in some sense we're going to be looking for a function whose derivative is 1 over x, you probably know that's just going to be equal to the natural log function, right? And if that is correct, then the correct answer will be the natural log of b minus the natural log of a, or the natural log of b divided by a as your answer. But we'll come back, to, come back to that little observation a little bit later. Let's see if we can derive a couple more important properties about definite integration via Riemann sums. Let's assume that we have two functions, f and g, and let's assume that both of these functions are continuous on a, b which is going to be important a little bit later on when we start building a little bit more advanced theory. So do integrals distribute over addition and subtraction? If so, in, it in some sense behaves sort of like derivatives do um, in differential calculus. Let's see if it does. So by definition, this is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to, let's do right endpoints, 1 to m, and this is going to be equal to f of a plus k delta x plus g of a plus k delta x. And that's going to be multiplied by delta x. So what I want to do is I want to distribute this delta x in and I want to distribute my uh, sum, summation n. And then I'm going to distribute my limit in as well. Because that's properties of real numbers, summations, and limits. So once I have that, I'm going to have the limits as n goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to 1 to m of f of a plus k delta x times delta x. And then I'm going to have plus the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to 1 to m of g of a plus k delta x times delta x. And that's precisely equal to the integrals of f and g respectively. So this is going to come out to the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx, which concludes our previous observation that possibly integrals distribute over addition for continuous functions, which in this case, they do. So that's very, very important.
Let's look at another theorem that I think is quite useful. The integral from a to b of some constant c times some other function f of x. Can that c be factored out of integration, sort of like they do with derivatives and limits and sums? Let's see. So this is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to 1 to n of c times f of a plus k delta x times delta x. So constants can distribute out of sums, and that constant can be distributed outside of our limit. So that's just going to give us c times the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to 1 to m of f of a plus k delta x times delta x. And this expression right here, that's just going to be our integral from a to b of our function f. So this is just going to come out to c times the integral from a to b f of x dx, so therefore constants can factor outside of our summations. So putting these two properties together, we get a very important property for integrals. In particular, the integral from a to b of c1f plus c2g dx. Now, I just want to mention that some people will shorthand notate this as the integral from a to b of c1f plus c2g, where you assume that the variable is like either x or y or t or z. In some sense, it doesn't matter as long as the variable is the same. Um, what we get here is just c1 times the integral from a to b of f plus c2 times the integral from a to b of g. Right? And you can show that as f of x dx and g of, g of x dx. Um, but in some sense, we have this particular relation. So what does that make definite integrals? So we have that definite integrals have the same property as derivatives in the sense that they are, are linear operators, just like matrices, just like derivatives, and so on. So with that very important property, let's close out with one nice example, and then we'll come back to more important properties of definite integrals at a later time. Let's do the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared. So what is this? So what we're going to do is we're going to be distributing integrals over each of those things, and we're going to be factoring out those constants. So what we're going to have is the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 dx, plus 2 times the integral from 1 to 2 of x, and then plus 3 times the integral from 1 to 2 of x squared. And then we're going to use the power rule on each of these integrals. right? So once we have that, we're going to have 1. Well, the integral of 1, that's just going to be equal to x. And then the integral of x is going to be 1 half x squared. And the integral of x squared is just going to be 1 third x cubed. And then we're going to be evaluating this as x goes to 2 and as x goes to 1. Before we do that, let's just simplify because 2 times 1 half is 1 and 3 times 1 third is 1. So this is just going to be equal to x plus x squared plus x cubed. And then we're going to evaluate this at 2, evaluate this at 1, and subtract. So once we evaluate this at 2, what will we have? So we're going to have 2 plus 2 squared is 4 plus 2 cubed is 8 minus 1 plus 1 squared is 1 plus 1 cubed is 1. So 8 plus 4 is 12 plus 2 is 14 and 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3 so we have 14 minus 3. So this is just going to come out to 11 and that's going to be the area underneath that curve um, from x is equal to 1 to x is equal to 2. So Riemann sums, which practically come from area approximations under the curve, allow us to find the exact area underneath these curves, provided that we take the limit of those Riemann sums. And once we take the limit of the Riemann sums, we get this beautiful um, thing called a definite integral, which appears to have some relationship with derivatives. But we'll come back to those theoretical observations at a later time. But for now, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.